Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome on this uh, glorious Swiss winter day to uh, the traditional uh, opening morning session on the global economy in association with Time magazine. My name is Michael Elliott. Uh, I'm the editor of Time International. I think this is the sixth year I've had the pleasure and honor of, of doing this. Before we get on to, uh, to this morning's business, I, I just want to say uh, a few words uh, about the circumstances in which we gather here at Davos. Uh, we, of course, all come here in the shadow of a terrible tragedy uh, in Haiti 10 days ago. Uh, many of you will have, will have picked up this uh, um, uh, sheet with, uh, with your uh, package of information yesterday, which details many of the initiatives at the Forum and the Clinton Global Initiative and uh, the UN are, uh, are uh, pursuing in relation to alleviating uh, the tragedy in Davos uh, in uh, Haiti this week, and I encourage you to, uh, to look at it and, uh, and do what you can. As always, uh, we're joined on, uh, on the stage this morning by a uh, terrific uh, array of, uh, of talent who will discuss with us uh, the prospects for the global economy uh, over the coming year. On my <coughs> immediate left, uh, Dennis Nally, chairman of PricewaterhouseCoopers International uh, from the USA. On my immediate right, uh, returning to the panel, uh, Nouriel Rubini of uh, the Stern School at New York University, the Cassandra of Washington Square, I think we can call you. Uh, <coughs> on uh, on Nouriel's right, David Rubenstein of the Carlisle Group. Uh, further on, another uh, welcome return to the panel, uh, Heiso Takanaka. Uh, from Keio University in Japan. Uh, immediately on Dennis's left, uh, Raghu Rajan from uh, the University of Chicago. If we're in the prophecy business, I think we can call you the Jeremiah of Hyde Park. How's that? Seeing as you and, and Nouriel were both uh, warning of, uh, of what might happen uh, a few years ago. And then finally, on, uh, on my far left, <coughs> Arif Nakvi. Uh, the founder and group CEO of Abraj Capital in the UAE. Uh, they'll all be as brisk and as brief uh, as they are brilliant, because I know from past experience that there'll be uh, lots, of, uh, lots of questions uh, from the floor. Uh, but I thought to kick us off and to very, very quickly remind us what has happened uh, and to give us a sense of how the global economy is likely to look in the next year, uh, I'd turn to, uh, to our, our regular uh, introducer of these sessions, Noriel Rubini. Noriel. <clears throat> a pleasure being back here. Uh, it's clear that the last year we had the worst uh, economic recession and financial crisis in a decade. The policy actions by authorities around the world led to a beginning of an economic recovery. And right now there is a debate about the shape of this recovery. Those who are more optimistic believe that we're going to go back to potential growth very rapidly, a V-shaped recovery. I'm more in the camp of those who believe it's going to be a U-shaped recovery, anemic, subpar, below trend, what the folks at PIMCO call the new normal. And there is even a risk of a double deep recession, downside risk, maybe low probability, but something we have to think about. So what's going to be the outlook for the US, for Eurozone, Japan, and for emerging markets? I would summarize my view by saying that emerging market economy is going to do better than advanced economies, first of all. In advanced economies, the first half of the year is going to be better than the second half of the year. The first half, we're going to see the effects of the monetary and fiscal stimulus, restocking of inventories, base effects, and other temporary factors. But the second half of the year, I see a faltering of growth in US, in Europe, and in Japan. Now, why do I believe it's going to be a U-shaped recovery? First of all, labor market conditions are still very weak. Unemployment rate around 10% US in the Eurozone. Job growth is going to be less labor force growth, so unemployment rate is going to go up. Secondly, this was a balance sheet recession due to excessive leverage and debt. And while there is a lot of talk about deleveraging, the private sector debt ratios are stabilizing at high level. And now as a way of socializing private losses, we have a massive releveraging of the public sector with increases in public debt and deficits. Now, if you take this interpretation of the crisis, in addition to the 
weakness in the labor market, there are other reasons why the recovery is going to be anemic and advanced economies. First of all, consumption has to grow less than GDP in order to increase savings the leverage. Therefore, GDP growth is going to be slow. Secondly, with capacity utilization at 70% US and Eurozone, capex spending by the corporate sector is going to be anemic. Third of all, the credit markets are still very crunched. In advanced economies, credit growth is still negative. Even if and when it's going to become positive, it's going to be more anemic than the years of the credit boom. And therefore, the ability of the financial system to finance residential investment, construction activity, capex spending, and so on, is going to be more constrained. Four, the fiscal stimulus by the second half of the year becomes a drag on growth. And therefore, unless there is a recovery of private demand, the recovery is going to be slow. And if we respond to this fiscal drag by accelerating spending and reducing further taxes, at some point, financial markets are going to worry about runaway fiscal deficit and monetization. You can have a backup in long-term yields. It's going to crowd out the recovery. Finally, global imbalances. The overspending countries that were running current account deficits now are retrenching like the US while the oversaving countries like China, Germany, Japan, emerging markets are not compensating for the fall in demand by the overspending by reducing their savings rate and increasing their own spending. So globally, when there is a glut of capacity, there is going to be a weaker recovery of aggregate demand. So those are the reasons why there's going to be a U-shaped recovery. Now, if I'm bearish about the United States, I'm also bearish about the Eurozone. In the Eurozone, especially in the periphery, take Greece, but the same problem occur in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal. There is not just a public debt sustainability problem, there is also a competitiveness problem. They were losing market shares to China and Asia, then wages grew more than productivity, unit labor costs were rising, real appreciation, current account deficits. So even if you solve the debt and fiscal problem, you still have a competitiveness problem. This is the very first test of the monetary union in the Eurozone, and I think that I'm quite bearish about that, about the growth prospects, especially of the periphery of the Eurozone. I'm also concerned about what's going on in Japan, where unless there is an acceleration of structural reform, there is anemic growth, the demographic is against you, there's a very large stock of public debt, there is a beginning again of acceleration of deflation. So the overall outlook for advanced economies is weak. You can be more bullish about the emerging markets for three reasons. The potential growth at 5 to 7% is greater than advanced economies, that is 2 or 3%. They did not have, with the exception of Central Eastern Europe, the kind of leverage in the financial sector and the household sector that was a problem in the advanced economies. And they've been able to do kind of cyclical monetary fiscal stimulus, given the shock coming from the center of the global economy. However, a few caveats. China alone cannot be the only engine locomotive of global growth. After all, Chinese GDP is only 4 trillion. The US, European, and Japanese GDP is 40 trillion. Second point, the model of export-led growth with big currency in Asia and China is now challenged by the fact that countries like the US are spending less, consuming less, and importing less. And what China has been doing is by stimulating public demand, but eventually the demand has to move from net export to private consumption demand. Unfortunately, there are structural reasons why consumption rates are low and savings rates are high in China. And the response of China has been to do even more fixed investment, increasing the glut of capacity that is existing in China. So while on one side China is overheating in the short run, I think their policy response is going to lead to a glut of capacity in real estate, in manufacturing, that eventually is going to have deflationary pressures in China and around the world. So those are important caveats. So in the short run, I see deflationary pressures in the advanced economies, since we have a slack in goods and labor markets. Eventually, over time, monetization of fiscal deficits is going to lead to rising long-term interest rates and the crowding out of recovery. One important point is that the sovereign risk is now increasing in advanced economies. We have trouble in Greece, in Ireland, in UK. And eventually, unless there is fiscal consolidation, even in the US and Japan, the bond market vigilantes might wake up and realize there's going to be a fiscal problem down the line. Final observation about financial sector reform. I think that the proposals of the Obama administration are going finally in the right direction. And now people like Trichet and Mervyn King are also supporting those kind of restrictions. But in my view, those restrictions are not enough. If financial institutions are too big to fail, they're just too big and they should be broken up. It's not enough just to take away prop trading activity from bank holding companies. I think that the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act was a mistake and we should separate commercial banking from investment banking. So the reforms are going in the right direction, but we should win more to have a more sustainable and stable financial system. Thank you very much, Nouriel. We'll pick up on uh, financial, uh, uh, financial market and financial sector reform with Raghu uh, later on. I, I very much want to make sure that we, that we take a look at the global economy, but I think it's useful, particularly with everything that's happened in the last week, that we sort of get a baseline view 
of what's happening in the U.S. Uh, Dennis, uh, you talk to a lot of uh, leading <coughs> CEOs, industrialists, uh, uh, private sector companies. How does it look to you? Well, thank you. I, I agree with many of the comments from Nuriel. We just completed a, a global CEO survey, 1,200 CEOs from across the world surveyed 52 countries. Sentiment uh, pretty much uh, as we've been talking about in terms of uh, things much better today than what they were 12 months ago. Uh, you know, we all know the environment a year ago, very much one of survival today, I think uh, much more optimism. But I would couch that as uh, being cautiously optimistic about uh, the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, in particular, you start to see uh, issues around jobs, for example, uh, the whole issue of job creation. Uh, while 25% of the CEOs indicated that they would be adding jobs in the next 12 to 18 months, when you look at uh, the, the extent of job creation, it's probably less than 5%, so not a robust recovery from a job creation standpoint. And quite frankly, you have almost 25% of the CEOs in the survey who said they would actually be cutting jobs in the next 12 to 18 months. And I think that tells a story about how uh, the, the business community is really looking at the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Um, in terms of the, the management agenda uh, that, that uh, the CEOs are focused on, uh, very much focused on uh, cost issues, cost containment, cost management, productivity improvements, uh, supply chain uh, enhancements. Again, very much a short-term orientation in terms of um, the focus of management actions. Um, bottom line, cash flow is king. Uh, an intense uh, focus around liquidity. Uh, having been through a very difficult uh, 12 to 18 months in the past, uh, cash flow is very much uh, at the core of everything that uh, uh, people are focused on. And I'd say the other area that's getting an awful lot of attention deals with the whole question of risk management. Uh, and many CEOs in the survey, quite frankly, indicated that they were uh, caught off guard with some of the issues that came up over the last 12 to 18 months. And you're seeing a much more intense focus <coughs> around uh, the whole issue of how to manage risk, how to take much more of a strategic view on those issues, embedding those in business units and taking a longer term view and one of the lessons learned. So I think there's a number of areas that, uh, that coming out uh, of the last 12 to 18 months, uh, the business community is focused on, uh, but uh, it's fair to say we're not out of the woods yet. I think there's a very much a cautionary view as to what the next 12 to 18 months are gonna look like uh, and a lot of concern around a couple critical issues such as uh, the whole regulatory debate that uh, was referenced. We can spend more time on that uh, today. Obviously, one of the key concerns that the CEOs are, are most concerned about. And the second area, I think, that's getting a fair amount of uh, focus is the whole issue of protectionism and, uh, and the debate around that. And quite frankly, those two issues uh, combined uh, raise the concern level as to the strength of the recovery and whether or not that can, in, in effect, derail what it is we've seen in the last uh, several months here in terms of the next 12 to 18 months. So uh, better today than a year ago, but nonetheless not out of the woods yet is the way I would couch it. Thanks very much, uh, Dennis. I'm particularly pleased uh, that, you, uh, that you mentioned what CEOs are saying uh, about jobs and that Noriel picked up, uh, picked up uh, issues, labor market issues in his uh, opening remarks because, of course, I think one of the things that we've learned in the, in the past couple of weeks, particularly in the U.S., is that it's labor market issues, employment issues, and the, and the question of jobs that is driving so much of the political debate, which is changing the environment in which we think about the economy and financial reform. Uh, David, um, follow on and, uh, and give us a sense of your view, again, mainly of the US economy, and then we'll spread out in a little while. OK, uh, I guess uh, I agree with some of the comments that have already been made. I don't think I'd take either of these gentlemen on a marketing uh, trip with me to fundraise uh, for our funds, but uh, there's no doubt their comments are very perceptive. Just try to deal with reality. Uh, um, the U.S. economy has uh, largely recovered in, in, in the view of, of uh, professional investors, I think, from the worst of what we've gone through. We've, we've gone through a bit of a heart attack, and heart attacks are not fatal so much anymore. And so we've learned a lot, and I do think it's now a time where investors are beginning to put money back in the economy. In fact, while the deals done in 2004 to 2007 may not turn out to be the greatest investment, bank, investment deals of all time, in fact, of the 20 largest deals done in the United States during that period of time, none of them has actually filed for bankruptcy yet. 
Some are not in great shape, but none has actually filed for bankruptcy. And I think that they, a lot of them will work their way through the system and actually will get reasonably good returns. Some will get spectacular returns. The deals done in 2009 will turn out to be some of the best deals done in this decade because, uh, or in the, that decade and perhaps for the next five years or so, because the prices were very low. People got uh, extraordinarily good bargains and people bought things uh, at, at distressed types of uh, situations. So I think a lot of people will make a lot of money off of deals done in 2009. Going forward, there are a lot of great opportunities we see in the United States and around the world. The most attractive place to invest probably right now is the, emer the emerging markets. Uh, the emerging markets uh, did not go down as much as they traditionally do in a, a recession, in a global recession, and they re rebounded much more rapidly than the developed markets have. And as a result, China, India, Brazil, uh, among other places, are, are very attractive places to invest. Uh, Korea, Taiwan, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, uh, Russia are all places that uh, uh, we'll see a lot of capital going into these, these countries because uh, prices are, are lower, the, the growth rates are thought to be, and I think are likely to be very, very high, much more attractive in terms of growth rates than the developed markets in Western Europe, Japan, and the United States. Uh, in terms of specific sectors in the United States, I think uh, the energy economy, the energy will still be a very attractive, both the green economy or green energy uh, area and the carbon energy area will we'll still have, see a lot of demand and I think prices will go up and investments will be pretty attractive there. I think the healthcare sector, whether the legislation goes through or not, and it's unclear whether it will, will still be an important part of the U.S. economy and a great place to invest because the baby boomers are retiring and they will spare no expense in making sure that they have artificial hips, artificial everything else, plastic surgery, um, assisted living, everything that, that they can do with their money to make themselves live better and live longer, they will do, and a larger percentage of the U.S. Uh, GDP will go into health care. I also think financial services were unduly depressed during this recession, and therefore financial service investments will turn out to be extremely attractive for, for people who uh, are willing to go into that area. And last, I'd mentioned government-supported uh, areas. Uh, the United States government uh, is not uh, shrinking its size. It's supporting a lot of industries and is subsidizing a lot of industries, and a lot of those industries will be very attractive places to invest. In terms of the regulatory reform, it's unclear whether the President's new proposals will actually um, be adopted by Congress. Congress is operating right now in a mode where they don't really know exactly what the mood is in the, in the United States. They know that there's a mood for something to change, but it's not clear whether it's to beat up on business and be more of a populist uh, type of approach or whether to be more of a centrist approach and try to get the Republicans and Democrats to work together. And that will sort itself out over the next several months. Right now, I don't think that Congress is likely to pass any significant legislation in, in any area because I don't think they know exactly what the mood of the, con of the country really is and they're going to wait, wait a while for those things to sort out. To summarize, I'd say it is a, probably a pretty attractive time to invest because the prices are relatively low. <laughs> Um, I think the, the risk of systemic failure in the United States financial system or the global financial system is gone. And as a result, I think investors are now willing to put capital to work again and to get reasonably attractive rates of return. While they may not be as spectacular as they were for the deals done in 2009, I think the returns will be much better than they were for deals done in 2004 to 2007. <clears throat> Thank you very much. David put, uh, put on the table uh, the, uh, the, the um, mood of almost institutional paralysis in Washington, particularly in Congress, and I predict you'll hear a lot more about that uh, in, uh, in Davos this week. Arif, uh, Dennis, uh, uh, David said that, uh, that emerging markets uh, were particularly attractive in terms of investment. Noriel said that he was more bullish, uh, though cautiously, though cautiously, uh, on emerging markets. Uh, you're uh, an enormous investor in what we now call Manasseh, Middle East, uh, North Africa, South Asia. Uh, and you were telling me earlier that there was a very bullish mood in the Gulf. So tell us why. Well, to start with, I would take David on a fundraising trip with, with me because he speaks up my region so well. <laughs> so thank you, David. Uh, I think, um, you know, overall, uh, some of the comments I've heard from people in the panel here today, we really have to start differentiating ourselves between whether we're optimists or realists. I think most people that find their way to Davos are just naturally optimistic. Um, but we've been through such a massive shock in the global system that we can't expect to recover from it overnight. And you know, David said earlier that a lot of companies that were bought between 2004 and 7 have not filed for bankruptcy yet. I think we're still going to see a few more shocks in the global system. So I agree with what Nouriel is saying. Um, the problem is it is a globalized economy. So yes, we can talk about negativity or um, 
arguably less optimism in the West and the United States and so on compared to emerging markets. But we do take the cue from what is happening in other parts of the world, especially our governments. So when Western governments talk about regulation and re-regulation and arguably protectionism, um, I think our governments take a lot of notice in, in emerging markets, especially in the Minasa markets. And the problem with that is that we've just come out of protectionism mm -hmm. and we've just come out of intense regulation. So going back into that cycle is arguably very dangerous. Um, having said that, emerging markets are a very, very good place to be in right now particularly driven by the fact that we're making up for lost time. Um, it's the first time that emerging markets have found their feet. Um, we've always talked about them being more risky than the West. And you know, whenever investors were looking at the markets in, in the emerging world, they had a premium for risk. But when risk came, it came from home. Uh, so this rethinking of, of the parameters has been very interesting. And yet, because these markets have got liquidity, they've got strength, um, they're going to make up for lost time. Just looking at the region I invest in, which is Minasa, Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia, um, we account for, I'd say, about 30% of the world's population, half of which is under 25. That means 800 young adults and children looking to enter that consumer society that everybody craves. So I think the opportunities are tremendous. I think uh, because of that and because the liquidity of governments in the region, um, the expense that will be incurred on infrastructure uh, is going to be very, very large. And we're already seeing it in countries like Qatar and places like Abu Dhabi and so on, um, where and India, for example, where highways are being built yeah. uh, almost like they're coming out of a, a, a freight train. Uh, so, so it's interesting to see how the world's attention is, is going back in it. Just a small, uh, a quick word on the GCC. Um, I think the world cannot do without oil. And you know, for the foreseeable future, it is the fuel on which the global economy moves. And I think what people need to realize is 60% of the world's energy reserves sit under the ground in the GCC, 60%. And yet, annually, only 30% of global production, and I'm taking some license around rounding off the numbers. I'm not an economist. Uh, so 30% of annual production um, is actually coming out of the GCC. So this mismatch means that as we run out of oil or oil resource dwindles or as prices go up, the GCC's share in global production is just going to keep going higher and higher. So liquidity is very much there. Mm -hmm. uh, the desire to spend is very much there. And I think this time around, the desire to curtail excessive spending is very much there. So all in all, I think a very good place to be. I noted that the emerging markets, it's a, it's a dated term a bit. It was invented in the early 80s and probably was applicable then, but now the emerging markets include most countries in the world, actually, except for the United States, Western Europe, Canada, Australia, and Japan. Uh, in 2014, the GDP of the emerging markets will surpass the GDP of the developed markets. It's the first time it's ever happened. And so forth, therefore, really, it's, it's a little bit unfair to still call China an emerging market or India an emerging market when they're in the same category as Chad or Mozambique. The truth is, some of these countries have really emerged already, and, and we should come up with a better term. But, but there's no doubt that the large emerging markets are going to be among the most attractive places to invest over the next couple of years. Athens turns to Beijing for bond sale, just to, just to make your point. A headline that uh, I don't think we would have expected to see. Uh, only three years ago. Hey, so uh, give us uh, a sense of how this looks from East Asia. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. First of all, I am from Tokyo, not from Beijing. But, but anyway, <laughs> now let me describe what's going on in Asia. Uh, this year, 2010, will be a very impressive year for Asian countries, I think. First of all, uh, China's GDP will exceed that of Japan, definitely. And Shanghai's GDP or Shanghai production will exceed that of Hong Kong. So uh, Asian countries are now, in the short run, growing very rapidly, uh, China 9%, uh, Korea 10%, and Singapore sometimes 10 or more. Uh, but anyway, we should recognize that we are now on the track of double-shaped recovery, in my understanding, double-shaped recovery. Uh, this I also discussed last year. Uh, after the uh, Lehman shock, GDP stock price plunged. But in the first half of last year, it stopped. Now we see some time of recovery. But in my understanding, this is not sustainable in the current pace. Uh, two reasons for this uh, uh, recovery now. One is China factor. Uh, Chinese GDP, as I mentioned, is almost equal to that of Japan. This is increasing by 10%. This is affecting a lot to the uh, surrounding countries. This is the first factor. The second factor is uh, uh, fiscal expansion. We've never seen such a large scale of fiscal expansion in the history. 
uh, in our economic history. Uh, but important point is, I say, China's grow will, growth will continue, but fiscal expansion uh, will not continue, it's not sustainable. That's the most important point. In my understanding, we can uh, distinguish four groups uh, uh, in this region. One is the emerging country, BRICS maybe, uh, uh, especially China. This country will, uh, this country will continue uh, grow, to, to grow. Let me mention a little bit China. Now we still have an image. China's economy is growing based upon huge input of capital, input of labor, input of energy. However, this growth pattern has been changing dramatically in the, uh, in the last several years based upon the new uh, estimate. About one third, more than one third of China growth comes from technological progress or growth of total factor productivity. So the Chinese growth pattern is much more, in a sense, uh, uh, modernized and normalized. And also, they now have a very good uh, uh, know-how uh, for micromanagement, I think, especially monetary policy is now being uh, uh, provided. So that's mostly successful for macroeconomic management. This is the second reason. Anyway, so China and some uh, these uh, BRICS uh, countries or uh, emerging market will, in a, in a narrow sense, will continue to grow. The second pattern is uh, the countries, that the second category, the countries, which can, who can incorporate the dynamism of these countries like China. The typical case is Korea. Korean economy is now growing, as I mentioned, 10% uh, or so. Uh, the, these countries uh, like Korea, who, uh, who can, well, say, sell uh, middle grade product to middle class of emerging countries uh, can grow. The third country, third category is uh, particularly in Australia. The, some of them, some of these countries have a very exp explicit new type of growth strategy. In the case of Australia, maybe you know that they have a very uh, numerical target for population. Uh, the, uh, I understand a lot of more discussion on that. But anyway, uh, Chinese, uh, sorry, Australia's uh, population is expected to grow uh, by 60% or 70% in the coming 25 years or so. This is the third category. And first category is other countries, so European country, most European countries, the United States and Japan is belonging to that. Uh, very finally, I'd like to uh, raise two risk factors which are not discussed yet. One is uh, deflation. Based upon our very bitter experience of lost decade of Japan, this deflation is very difficult uh, to be tackled. Under the situation of deflation, the real interest rates go up, even if nominal interest rate is around 0%. We have been suffering from deflation for nearly 15 years. So I'd like to say the monetary policy role is very important under such circumstances. We have been discussing the role of fiscal policy for the last uh, several years, but monetary policy should be discussed mm -hmm. here. And the second point is, uh, well, also in the last year uh, or so, we discussed very intensively the need for activism of the government. But we should discuss now the how to avoid overactivism of the government. The symbol of overactivism is the protectionism. And also, uh, for some countries uh, in G7, uh, the general election will be held. Recession is there, activism is there, and the election is there. A lot of populist uh, po uh, policies are emerging. We have to be very careful for that. Thank you very much. Raghu, you and I were at a, a World Economic Forum um, conference in Delhi uh, just before Christmas, and, and uh, we were talking about the Indian economy and other developing economies. And I thought you were, you were particularly interesting then on the challenges that face uh, the, the developing economies. I'm trying to avoid the word emerging. So just, just talk, talk a little about, about how optimistic you are about growth outside the, the kind of core Atlantic economies and, the, and some of the challenges that face uh, the largest of them. Sure. Um, well, let, let me just start by taking off from uh, where Hazel left off. I mean, I, I do think we've moved from a uh, period of uh, great economic uncertainty to a period of great political uncertainty. And, and to my mind, the two numbers which, uh, which really reflect this uh, are 10 and 10. Uh, and what does that mean? 10% unemployment in the US, 10% growth in China. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, how does this play out as, uh, as we have the elections, uh, the midterm elections in the US and elections elsewhere? Uh, I think that's the great uncertainty. Uh, certainly, there could be a move towards populism. There could also be a move towards protectionism. Uh, both are potential, uh, uh, potential outcomes. And I think that's, that's one worry. Going to the issue of emerging markets themselves, I think the uh, the old description of emerging markets was indebted governments, very accommodative monetary policy, suspicion of markets, polarized electorates, 
and a suspect private sector. Mm. My sense is the countries that would most fit that description today are the industrial countries. <laughs> um, the, the problem, I think, uh, now, now, before jumping, I think, to, to argue that the emerging markets are the new industrial countries, I think we should pause and ask why this has happened. My sense is that what we've had is a situation of excess demand being created by the industrial countries. Now the, the hot potato, in some sense, of excess demand is being shifted to the emerging markets. Historically, they've never managed it well. Uh, that is why they actually cut back and let the US spend and relied on export-led growth. Question is, this time around, will they do it better? And I think at this point, we have to suspend judgment. The hope is that policies in emerging markets will be much better this time around. But demand is very hard to manage, uh, especially in your own country. And there is the risk of going from boom to bust uh, again. Uh, on India itself, I think India is, uh, is certainly uh, beginning a period of strong growth. Uh, it dipped quite a bit during the, uh, the recession, but has come back. Uh, on the backs of strong domestic demand, the auto sector is taking off, the housing sector is taken off, uh, and there's also a fair amount of rural demand, partly as a result of government policies providing uh, rural insurance. In some sense, if you look over the next 10 years, uh, India really should not have a problem growing, because the fundamentals are all in place. The demographics look good, a very young uh, population, which is increasing uh, the, uh, the labor force quite a bit. Savings should increase. This is the sweet spot that all the Asian economies had when they grew, uh, a very high uh, labor force, low dependency ratios. That's coming to uh, bear on India now. But India needs to create the jobs. To create the jobs for this labor force, it needs to improve infrastructure, which is really the key word in India today, uh, and has to also work very hard on shifting rural jobs to industrial jobs and service sector jobs. That means all the yeah. things that other countries have to do, India has to do in spades. Yeah. Uh, create that infrastructure, create education. Uh, and you know this is where uh, you have to start asking some questions of Indian policy. Is the implementation good enough? Should it be better? Is there too much populism at this moment? Are we, are, is India redistributing before, in fact, creating enough income to redistribute? And is it going to be held hostage to the entitlements it creates yeah. in the future? Of course, like every other emerging market, it's tackling the issue of inequality, which is creating political pressures. I think in India, there are the super rich and there are very, the very poor. That is creating tensions in society. And that's something this government is trying to address. Yeah. Nouriel, can I come back to you on, uh, on, on the, the developing economies? In your opening remarks, it seemed to me that you were trying to remind the audience that although there was an exciting growth story outside the US and the Atlantic world, one should be very, very cautious in jumping to the conclusion that what was happening outside the advanced industrial economies could, in any short-term scenario, replace uh, an absence of substantial growth in the in the traditional industrial economies. Am I am I summarizing you accurately? Yes, you know, for the last decade, <clears throat> the United States and a few other countries like UK, Spain, Ireland, Iceland, uh, Central Europe, Dubai, Australia, New Zealand, were the consumers of first and last resort, spending more than their income, running current account deficits. In part because all of this country had a housing bubble that now is going bust. While on the other side of the world, you had the producers of first and last resort spending less than their income running current account surpluses, China, emerging Asia, Latin America, Japan, Germany. Now the overspending countries are cutting on their spending, on their consumption, their imports, and therefore the oversaving country cannot rely anymore on producing more than they spend and selling the surplus to the overspending countries. And that's the challenge that I think China is facing of switching demand from net exports and fixed investment to domestic consumption. So that's one caveat for China. And for the rest of the BRICS, I would say Russia is in trouble. You have demographic decline, you have problems in terms of health of the population, you have institutional constraint to growth, you have a one-sided economy based only on oil and energy. You know, in the case of India, Reforms are occurring, but more slowly than in China. You need to have more openness to trade, to FDI, reforms in labor markets, size of the government, things of that sort. And in a democracy, it's much harder to do reforms faster than in an authoritarian regime like China. So those are the challenges that India is facing. In the case of Brazil, again, the growth prospects are positive. You have to give credit to Lula for bringing stability on the macro side, low inflation, fiscal adjustment. 
but they did not do any of the structural reforms that are needed, micro and structural, to lead to an acceleration of growth. We'll see who's going to be the next president, whether there's going to be commitment to do more of those. Structural reform is going to lead to an increase in the potential growth rate of, of, of Brazil. So I would say I'm cautiously optimistic about the BRICS, but in each one of them, you have different types of economic and financial challenges that have to be addressed over time. Very good. David, It's yeah. very difficult to predict exactly where economies are going to go over the next six or months or a year. I, I think uh, uh, you've done a very good job in predicting a lot of the problems that the economies uh, face over the last couple of years. But most economists generally over longer periods of time don't have a great track record of predicting six months or a year or two years in advance. And so professional investors don't often rely as much on economists as other things. And right now, I'd say what... There's nothing with disrespect to the, to the <laughs> economic <laughs> profession, uh, but sometimes, uh, like they say, generals fight the last war, economists fight the last recession. And I think that uh, professional investors are often looking at other factors. Right now, the thing that I think most prof professional investors are most worried about is the uncertainty about government policy. What is government going to do uh, in reaction to the problems we've had over the last couple of years? And will there be an overreaction? Uh, markets often overreact, and sometimes governments overreact. I think most professional investors are worried that governments in the, in, the, in the developed markets, as well as perhaps the emerging markets, are going to overreact to the problems we've had the last couple of years. And I think it would be better if we were to have uh, less of an overreaction and let markets uh, you know, not be unregulated uh, completely, but not overreact to some of the problems we've had. I think in terms of uh, um, what the U.S. government is likely to do, no one really knows whether uh, the Congress will go more of a populist mode or of a more of a uh, centrist mode. Uh, will Rogers, a, a, a humorist in the United States, once famously said that the country's never safe as long as Congress is in session. And <laughs> there may be some, some merit to that. Uh, we don't really know what our Congress is going to do right now because Congress is still reading the tea leaves from the, the election in Massachusetts. And that is a, a case lesson in being careful what you wish for because it was the Democrats not to, to disparage them, but the Democrats who changed the law in Massachusetts to enable there to be a special election. Had the law that had been in effect for nearly a century uh, uh, been allowed to stay in effect, um, the governor would have appointed the senator. The governor presumably would have appointed a, a Democratic senator. That Democratic senator would have been the 60th vote. The health care legislation would have gone through, and we wouldn't have gone through the kind of uh, upheaval and uncertainty we now have in the United States. So I think uh, be careful what you wish for in some cases, both in, in professional investing and also in, in economics. <laughs> that gives me a nice segue to, to bring Raghu back in. The, the title of this, uh, of this session, we should remind ourselves, is, is to do with the new normal. And, and, and part of the new normal, it seems to me, is a, is a radically changed intellectual environment uh, than, uh, than we were enjoying uh, or than we were, than we were experiencing three or four years ago, particularly uh, as it comes to financial market reform, to banking reform, and so on. And that changed intellectual environment is, of course, melded with a changed political environment that, uh, that David uh, was, uh, was talking about a second ago. You've been writing on, on, on this sort of stuff for many years, famous um, uh, paper in 2005 at the Jackson Hole Conference on, uh, on the risks of financial innovation and then a terrific uh, op-ed in, uh, in the Financial Times just yesterday. Stand back a little and kind of try and explain how the intellectual climate has changed as one, as one looks at these issues and how that is, uh, is likely to affect um, the political debate, particularly in, uh, in the developed world in the U.S. Well, clearly what's, uh, what's happened is there's a lot of fear of, uh, of market forces. Now, whether the market should be feared or something else should be feared is, 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 is an important question. Uh, but clearly, I think across countries, uh, there is a suspicion that the markets didn't perform well. There's also, in some countries, uh, particularly the United Kingdom, based on the example of Iceland, uh, real fear that you yeah. have an uncontrolled financial sector which could take the economy down. I mean, in uh, Iceland, many of the liabilities of the financial sector have rebounded to the government and are enormous uh, relative to its GDP. And certainly countries like the United Kingdom and perhaps even Switzerland feel that they have a monster which they need to curb. So the, the kind of regulatory efforts in, uh, in, in the United Kingdom, to my mind, stem to some extent from fear of the monster they've created. In the US, it's more outrage. Uh, the unemployment numbers set aside against, set against the huge bonuses, I think, uh, make for a, a lot of pretty politics. And as a result, I think you're going to get a lot of action uh, just on the basis of that, that outrage. Somebody 
uh, is, uh, is making too much money and at the expense of Main Street. That's going to be the rhetoric. And then there's a sense of, uh, of dismissing the financial sector as unimportant. That's also uh, an undercurrent that you see. Uh, you know, nobody's going to get financing from this sector for a few years to come, so why not shut it down? What's it doing anyway uh, that's useful? Uh, they're not lending, so let's go ahead and, 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 and attack it. Um, and, and so in all this, I think, the, with these undercurrent, uh, undercurrents uh, uh, sort of at work, uh, actions that have maximum visibility are, in a sense, making their way to the fore. Uh, you know, the, the action on bonuses, now how much that, that will help uh, is debatable, uh, but certainly that's up front. Now, of course, uh, recently talk about uh, banks being too big and cutting them down to size. The problem with many of these, of course, is uh, while broadly uh, they, they make sense at first glance, when you look at them in, in closer detail, you have to ask whether they tackle the real problems. And this is where I disagree with uh, what Nouriel said about the financial sector, agreeing with much of what he said on the, on the real sector. I mean, too big to fail is just one potential problem. I mean, there are many other problems. You could have too many to fail. You could break up the big banks into many small banks and have to bail them all out. That's, that has happened in the past also, so long as they all take the same risk. So I, I think we are in danger of just attacking the most visible problem without thinking through what, in fact, we need to do in order to make sure what happened didn't happen again. And, and the downside to that kind of, uh, of attack is you go in a yo-yo. You over-regulate. And then because you overregulate, you start uh, whittling away the regulation. And then you get, again go too far and whittle away too much. So to, to, to just end, uh, I think the mistakes we are in danger of making, we're going to regulate the visible. Uh, we're going to compound interventions. We did, made some interventions in the past. We'll add more interventions in order to undo the effect of the previous interventions. We get more of a mess. And we're going to raise costs in the financial system a lot so that when, in fact, we come out of this recession, the financial system is going to be unable to step up. The greatest danger, of course, is what I've pointed out, that the emerging markets take their cue right. from the industrial economies and do exactly the same and find that they've killed their own growth. I have three people wanting to come in. Dennis first. You, in, in the UK, uh, fear is driving policy. In the US, outrage is driving policy. Is either a good driver of decent policy? You, you know, I don't think there's a big debate about that there needs to be some form of regulatory change to take place. I, I think the real question is, what is it? And, you know, I, I'm reminded by the fact over the last 12 to 18 months, central banks, uh, different regulators from around the world, uh, the business community, a lot of interested parties worked very effectively to deal with the crisis, the financial crisis, in a very coordinated, collaborative way. Uh, to me, that's the type of reform that really needs to take place. The debate needs to take place to really deal with, I think, a set of very complex issues that really affect our global capital markets. What you're seeing today, I believe, is a lot of populist debate and discussion taking place on a country-by-country -country basis mm -hmm. that, quite frankly, uh, looks good, sounds good when you look at the headlines uh, and the reporting of that. The question is, will they really be effective in dealing with the long-term issues affecting uh, our global capital markets? And one of the biggest fears I think we all have is that we will rush to put through reform and changes uh, because it seems like the right thing to do, and maybe they are in the short term, but will they effectively deal with the issues that gave rise to this financial crisis and therefore not really deal with the substantive issues that will really fix uh, the, the, the situation that we've dealt with over the last 12 to 18 months? So uh, I think there's great discussion and debate taking place with the G20 and with various regulators from across the world, people who are knowledgeable about the issues that gave rise to the crisis. I think it's much more complicated than compensation, for example. I think there needs to be issues around transparency dealt with, uh, issues around uh, you know, regulatory <laughs> reform changes, uh, transparency, and, and whatever. Those are the fundamental issues that I think need to be addressed. Uh, and if they're done in the right way, I think they can really help sustain uh, our global capital markets for the longer term. Congress is, excuse me, Congress is going to pass some kind of regulatory reform. We don't know exactly what it's going to be. It'll be something so that they can go home to the voters and say, we passed something. It probably won't be as grandiose as some people have proposed. But the bigger problem that Congress has to address are the three Ds, which are debt, deficit, and the dollar. And right now, our debt in the United States is $14 trillion, not counting $41 trillion of unfunded pension liabilities for Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. It's roughly, when you add it all up, about 
$230,000 per every man, woman, and child in the United States. They have to get that under control, and they have to do that beginning with getting the deficit under control. We're running a $1.4 <clears throat> trillion dollar debt, a, a deficit every year. Our deficit is bigger than anybody else's annual budget. And until they can get those under control, we're not going to deal with a third problem, which is the dollar. And the dollar is the only reserve currency in the world, and it's going to be the only reserve currency for at least the next 10 or 15 years. And it's going to be sinking down a fair bit increasingly unless we deal with the debt and the deficit. And the only way Congress is probably going to be able to do that is some type of commission that's now being proposed. The president will probably address it tonight to, that really, in effect, does something that requires Congress to, in effect, uh, cut spending and increase taxes a bit almost uh, despite their, their best instincts otherwise. Unless we get con uh, spending under control and our debt under control, I don't think the dollar can really uh, be the reserve currency for as long as the people in the United States would like it to be. And th that, I think, is the far greater problem than regulatory reform. Uh, if you wanted to come in. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, I just wanted to say that, like everybody else here, I think regulation is a good thing. And it's important for everybody to know a given set of rules by which they operate. Um, and I think that better regulation should emerge that realigns market participants with regulators, not the other way around. And the important thing is, picking up from something someone said earlier, it actually is not uh, being operated or orchestrated on a global basis. Regulators in different countries are looking at things slightly differently. And I think that um, populism is actually ruling the game right now. So a lot of what we are hearing is coming out of, uh, in an effort to assage populist uh, sentiment, but this is a very, very big issue. It is populism that is being uh, addressed, not sentiment. Mm. And sentiment is actually a very, very different thing from what needs to be done, for example, in the UK by a government that appears to be on its last legs and is doing a lot of things in order to win popular support. But sentiment is totally different. For example, US companies are actually turning around. They're doing well. But unemployment is increasing. So the difference between the people that work in those companies and the companies themselves is a gulf that is becoming wider and wider. So the way I look at it is if you go back into just just for a second, stopping and thinking that this is a crisis that has now been three years in the making or evolving. Okay, and people, we, we're dealing with people. We're dealing with sentiment. People are emotional. Okay, and people react with emotion. So, who is the most important constituent in the global economy? It was the housewife in Utah. It may no longer be the housewife in Utah. Five years from now, it could be the office worker in Shanghai, with no disrespect to any other country in between. So we have to stop and think for a second, how do we address emotion in the context of everything that's happening? Tough years, ladies and gentlemen, change people's behavior. They change mm -hmm. people's core values. And no economist model accounts for emotion. That's where I have a problem. Uh, and I hope we pick that up during the week. Hey, so and then Nouriel will come back in. I'm an economist. Sorry, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I used to be a policymaker at the time. Uh, I was in charge of the disposal of a non-performing loan 10 years ago uh, in Japan as a cabinet member. Let me talk a little bit based upon my experience. Sentiment is very important. Maybe expected, expectation is very important, I'd like to say, as an economist anyway. Uh, but anyway, based upon experience as a policymaker, I have, a strong, I have one strong lesson. That is, uh, it is impossible for, polic uh, for politicians to understand the finance. This is a very important lesson for me. <laughs> well, uh, at the same time, well, uh, we now have two important lessons from the current uh, situation. One is so-called shadow bank. Shadow banking yeah. uh, should uh, be regulated to some extent. Yeah. It is inevitable. Uh, we uh, uh, policymakers have been focusing for a long time on the banking sector. The shadow banking is important. Another factor is, uh, well, human capital training is much more important. Uh, technological progress in uh, finance, uh, financial technology is not bad. Uh, but this time, human capital could not catch up with this advance of technology. And also, this is applicable to the general public. Uh, we have to decide in the final stage in the democratic, uh, democratic uh, process. Under such circumstances, the support of the general public is very much needed. At the same time, another important lesson is bankers, financiers are also hated by the general public. So it is sometimes very difficult. Uh, well, the discussion among specialists, it's quite understandable, and I can expect it's they are now discussing in the right way. However, uh, in the very final stage, the uh, education of the general public and strong leadership 
by political leaders are uh, uh, indispensable. This is the only way to avoid so-called populism we have been discussing. So uh, then, then based upon my experience in Japan, we had, it, it took 10 years or so to persuade the people. Uh, so strong leadership is uh, uh, very finally needed in this process. Very interesting point. Nouriel, you wanted to come back in. Some people in the panel express concern about overregulation of the financial system. My concern is the opposite, that we're going back to business as usual. You know, there is now increasing leverage and risk taking by financial institutions. Profits are rising, lots of crowd trading activity. You know, compensation is again uh, becoming obscene in terms of bonuses. There is no really reform of compensation by having clawbacks or other kind of incentive compatible compensation. We have zero interest rates among advanced economies, we have quantitative easing, we have forbearance, and we forget that you know, between recapitalization, liquidity support, insurance and guarantees, about $11 trillion were committed to the financial system by the US alone, three out of the 11 already dispersed. So we have a situation in which right now we're returning to business as usual. There is now dollar funded country trades, there are asset bubbles created in the United States, in emerging markets around the world, and I worry that we're at the beginning of a cycle of excessive and now return to asset bubbles, to credit growth, to leverage is gonna to lead to the next bust. So the issue that in short term, we of course we need the stimulus and forbearance, but we have to impose restrictions on the financial system to avoid making the same mistake of the past is forefront to me. And I think it's worth uh, picking up on a point that Arif made a second ago. Uh, another thing that um, indicates return to business as usual, there's been a little bit of discussion here about the need for international cooperation. The G20's been, uh, been mentioned uh, a number of times. But in fact, if you think back to where we were on this panel a year ago, hoping that there would be significant international cooperation, shared regulatory regimes, and so on and so forth, you would have to say, wouldn't you, Raghu, you're nodding your head, that that had run into the sand so far? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, it has run into uh, paralysis. Uh, yeah. at, at least uh, we're not seeing much come out. Now, right. it may be that what is going on is reason thinking. The problem is the time frame for action is very limited, uh, especially with the pain that the general public is facing. And they want to see something right. done about this. They see, want, want to see something done about the problem. And I think part of the problem also has to do with, uh, with the fact that the regulators and the finance ministries have been treating the financial sector with kid gloves so far. And, and that goes to Nouriel's point that uh, some of these uh, high bonuses and so on are waving a red flag in the eyes of the public. And uh, unfortunately, the banking sector has not covered itself with glory also, uh, recognizing the mood of the public and, and, and reacting appropriately. But I think it ultimately goes back to Hazel's point, which is that the details of what need to be done on a careful basis are very hard to communicate in public. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, the, uh, the tendency is to do visible things which are maybe peripheral mm -hmm. to what really needs to be done. For example, if you look at the history of Glass-Steagall, it really had nothing to do with the problems that actually emerged at that time. But it was a blow against the banks, which Senator Carter Glass had been trying to inflict for many years, and he got his chance finally and right. did it. And afterwards, there are lots of uh, anecdotes about how it might have worked, et cetera, but we, we, you know, it wasn't based on the data. And I think we're in danger of doing something like that again. Uh, just inflict a blow for the sake of inflicting a blow, though not necessarily uh, in order to further regulation. Finally, on, on international cooperation, there are a few things on which cooperation can work. I think capital requirements and on a, a bankruptcy regime. These are hard problems. I think otherwise, a lot of the country by country regulation has to be done by country right. regulators. There's not right. that much scope for cooperation because the financial systems vary so much across countries. The US is very different from China or India and I, the same regulations might be hard to apply. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, small, comment, small comment. Yes, I, the, we are now discussing the need for international cooperation. I do not deny that. That's multilateralism. At the same time, we should seek very seriously for the best combination of multilateralism and unilateralism. Please consider the case of the, the London Conference in the 1933. At that time, European countries uh, tried to uh, preserve the gold standard, but the, the United States took some kind of unilateralism to deny that. This, this decision, advance the global system. So, so sometimes, sometimes, yes, basically I understand international cooperation is needed, but, uh, but at, the same, at the same time we should consider the very solid attitude of one, two leaders mm. to move forward. That's, that's the important point to be discussed. I think. 
Uh, I think um, we should go to, uh, go to questions from the audience. Uh, we've got a uh, little over 20 minutes, and uh, I'm sure you have um, uh, lots of questions uh, for our terrific panel. You can already see lots of hands up. Uh, gentlemen, uh, oh, it's um, Ernesto, uh, who's bidding in an auction. Just wait for the, uh, for the uh, microphone to come over. Please identify yourself, and, uh, and then we'll get Yes, going. Ernesto Cedillo from Yale University. Nouriel, a few months ago, you wrote uh, a very provocative FT of Eth. I think you call it the mother of all bubbles. Most of oh, us yes. thought the mother was in 07, but you were talking about the near future. Now this reference uh, to these uh, bubbles that we have seen all over the world, you talk about commodities, stock markets, and so on, uh, was only mentioned marginally in your presentation. Have you become less concerned about what this near zero interest rate policy is causing in the world? To Ragu, do you think that this uh, light uh, glasses Stigel Volcker rule is going to cause uh, some sort of financial repression in the banking sector so that the other part uh, will explode not so far in the future? <coughs> They're very clever at Yale. They managed to get two questions in in, in one. But anyway, Nouriel on bubbles and then uh, and then Rago on the Volcker rule. Uh, well, in that FT piece, I spoke about the mother of all carry yeah. trades. The, the dollar, carry trade, carry right. trades. The dollar carry trade. Right. Yeah. Suggested there is a significant amount of this carry trade going on, not only towards high yielding interest rate countries, but also towards commodities, equities, credit, emerging markets. The high correlation between all asset classes suggests that exactly these dollar-funded carry trade are driving these increases in asset prices. Of course, the recovery in asset prices in part is due to the fact there is a global economic recovery <coughs> and less risk aversion, but I think it's becoming too much, too fast, too soon. And the U.S. monetary policy right now is exported to the rest yeah. of the world because China is repacked to the U.S. dollar. The rest of Asia emerging markets are worried about appreciating their currency too much. They're all intervening very aggressively. The rate of reserve accumulation in emerging markets is now at the annualized rate of $1 trillion. Most of it is not fully sterilized and is leading to excessive monetary and credit growth that is going into asset prices from commodity to credit to equity and so on. And I think that eventually, if this asset bubble were to continue, become excessive, you could have a massive correction and that's going to be dangerous. So I think that US monetary policy is really imposing a significant uh, easing bias towards all other countries in the rest of the world. Ari, if I could, before I, I get right on to the second part of the question, Ari, if I could see you sort of n n nodding with a slightly worried look as Actually, you had. Just agree. Just agree. Very just good. Agree. Okay, Ragu on the on the Volcker rule, as it's uh, now called. Well, I, I I think it's uh, again one of those rules which makes a lot of sense when you think about it, but when you think about it a little, little more, you worry. I mean, my, my <laughs> sense is size is a very crude measure, and clearly there have been some large banks which have been very poorly managed, and I think uh, there would be a consensus generally that they should be broken up. There's also a sense that there were some large banks which were very well managed. And the question we have to ask ourselves is do we get, get less risk? When you get a lot of tiny banks which take the same risks. Uh, there are also uh, situations in the world where we've rescued banks because there were too many to fail, even though they were all very small. So uh, I'm not sure that it necessarily will help uh, the risk taking if we you know, focus on size and as, a, as an absolute limit. And the point that you're making is, to some extent, it could drive activity away from the banking sector elsewhere. And that, I think, is something yeah. that a lot of proposals have to answer. Yeah. Are we better off seeing it in the banking sector mm -hmm. or having it hidden somewhere else where it comes back to hit the banking sector in the worst of times? That's exactly what we saw during this crisis. How does this proposal deal with that? Are we going to move activity right. away? in order for it to actually come back and hit I us. Say, I think the asset I, bubble I, I, point. Ari first, then uh, the asset David. bubble point. You know, Ken <laughs> Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt have come That's out with Arif. an epic study <laughs> that showed that over the last 800 years, uh, we've had a, a lot of asset bubbles, and, and uh, governments haven't been able to really deal with them. And I think we should recognize that we're not going to be so smart as to eliminate all bubbles uh, around the world. It's just not, it's not in our, 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 our ability to do so. It's been, they've been around a long time, and they're going to be around for at least another 800 years or so. Um, the second point is, on the Volcker rule, uh, I don't really know whether it's going to go into effect or not. Congress has to deal with it. The president's just proposed it. Um, in the private equity industry isn't certain what its position is, because if we come out in favor of it, it might not pass, 
and if and because uh, uh, you know our, our own popularity is not so wonderful, so we're not sure whether we should say anything about it or not. But I suspect that probably something like that will will ultimately get done. Maybe not quite what the president proposed, but something along those lines probably will get done. Though with a transition rule of three to five years, so I don't think it'll have a dramatic effect on any institution right away. Bubbles <laughs> like like the poor and Manchester United sadly are always with us. Uh, Arif, I think you? we talk about I think we talk about regulation. And we talk about how um, you know, Glass-Steagall should be repealed, X, Y, Z should happen. We forget about the fundamental pillar of capitalism, which is the shareholder. Okay? And what is happening right now is we're looking at institutions, and we're talking about too big to fail, and we're looking at issues relating to the banking industry. I've had lots of conversations with very, very senior bankers in the last couple of years who said, look, we didn't suffer enough pain. We went through a process where we did wrong, things happened, but we didn't get punished. Governments bailed us out, whatever happened, and we're back to the same old games. What has happened to the role of the shareholder turning around and holding people accountable? It's gone away, it seems. We've completely delegated our ability to do anything as individual activists, as shareholders, to government and seeking more reform. I think we should pull back some of what made capitalism good and great and turn around and say, what is it that is wrong with that institution? How do we bring accountability right. back? Lady in the front row. Please, uh, I, there's a microphone coming, and please identify yourself. Hilda Ochoa, Strategic Investment Group, Washington, D.C. There is a silver bullet, but no one wants to look at it. And a silver bullet, in the case of a corporation that has more expenses than revenue, is to restructure the balance sheet. In the case of a government, the only way they've thought of restructuring the va balance sheet is to devalue the debt. But there are tons of assets that can be sold and can be sold to surplus countries. I'm talking about the United States. The United States government is the largest owner of land and natural resources in the country. Why, are we, why is the dialogue not concentrating on a rationalization of the use of natural resources and other assets in the United States by selling them to surplus countries? to raise three to five trillion dollars in assets over the next five years? Well, because I think um, what would happen is, that, well, there was a rumor uh, in the late 70s that, uh, or, or I should say in the early 80s, that uh, foreigners were buying up American farmland. And as a result, uh, le legislation was passed to make it more difficult to do that. Uh, the, the reaction in the United States to that, I think, would be um, legislation that would restrict uh, the sale of these assets <laughs> to foreigners because we'd be concerned we'd be selling our natural assets and national assets to foreigners, and that would probably produce a, a political problem in the United States. So I don't really think that would likely solve the problem, even though it might economically do so. I think politically it would be un untenable for the United States to tolerate selling our major natural resource assets to foreigners. I don't think it would work. <laughs> Nuriel. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, th there are definitely political constraints. I think that in addition to trade protection, is right now there is a concern about asset or financial protection. We saw it in the Sinoc Unical case, in the Dubai port case, you know. As long as foreigners were willing to buy low yielding treasuries in the United States, th things were fine. When they decided they want to take control of real U.S. assets, either private or public, now there is a political backlash against it. I think it's a very unfortunate. Right. There's a backlash against sovereign wealth funds, but that's a political constraint we're going to face. Of course, you know, a debtor country like the United States cannot be too choosy about the way the rest of the world is financing itself. And at some point, the U.S. will have to deal with the fact that given the large current account deficit, given the large fiscal deficits, unless it allows the foreigners to buy the kind of assets they want to buy, and increasingly that's going to be equity, foreign direct investment, things of that sort, rather than low-yielding treasuries, there'll be a financing problem. But the traditional way we deal with this is inflating our economy, as you know, and uh, I'm an expert in that because I helped to get inflation to 19 percent when I was in government, which is not easy to do. But um, <laughs> I, I, we've had, over the last 20 years or so, inflation has been roughly 2.2 to 2.3 percent in the United States. It's almost certainly going to go up, and that's how we're going to deal with our debt problem. That's the only way, is, I think, is inflate our way out of it. Never mind uh, scenic and uh, unicorn and stuff like that. Yeah. Some of us are old enough to remember when selling Pebble Hills golf course was a, was a political, yeah, yeah. Uh, political issue, my, too. In my view, the inflation solution to the debt problem is not going to be the right solution. You know, if you're going to have high inflation, eventually you're going to need the Volcker style. Mm -hmm. Very severe recession like the 8082 one. Two, a lot of the debt is short term. It's going to essentially roll over at higher interest rates. The expected inflation goes up. And last time we used the inflation tax in the 70s, we're a net creditor country and a net lender. 
running current account surpluses. If we were to use the inflation tax, the rest of the world is financing us today. It's not going to sit idle and accept a real levy on the dollar assets. There's going to be a rush out of the dollar. It could be a collapse of the dollar, a spike in interest rates, and a severe recession. So unfortunately, while there is a temptation to use the inflation tax, because running the printing presses seems to be the path of least resistance, yeah. given the willingness to raise taxes or cut spending, the inflation solution would be actually much more damaging than alternative ones. Joe, yeah. right in the front row. Michael, I want to. I'm Joe Schoendorf. I'm with Axel Partners. We are venture capitalists that fund high tech innovation around the world China, India, Israel, Europe, Silicon Valley. You saw me this morning and you said, hello, how's it going? And I said to you, you know, really, really great, but I feel bad saying that here. <laughs> uh, and the conundrum is this. Uh, in the 40-some years I've been in Silicon Valley, I've never seen more core innovation that's happening. Whether it's in personalized medicine that you're going to hear about or alternative energy or the digital economy. Look at Google's numbers, look at what Amazon's probably going to do. We just looked at our companies, most of whom you haven't heard of yet. Mm -hmm. They didn't just do good last year, they blew through numbers. So you've got this economy that's the digital economy that's going like this, and there's a shortage of workers. And by that I mean we don't have the talent we need in the US, yeah. programmers and people who can design chips and make these things work. And on the other hand, we've got an unemployment that's 10%, and if you count the real number, meaning people who would like more work than they can find, it's a much bigger job than that. And the jobs that this new economy is going to produce, by the very nature of the technology, we're designing labor out of it. I mean, for us to sit here and believe that China isn't going to be the world's largest producer of solar panels is naive. The jobs to put these things on people's roofs aren't going to pay the 70 or 80 dollars an hour that the automobile industry paid. So I'm curious how this conundrum works out and what you think about it. The good news is we've never had a brighter future from a global innovation point of view. What it does to global employment is a TBD. Yeah, you know, come on it's in. A, yeah, it's 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 really yeah. a great point because uh, one of the one of the areas that we really focused on in the CEO survey. Uh, was this whole question of talent and talent development. And, and notwithstanding uh, the comments around unemployment uh, and uh, jobs over the next 12 to 18 months, uh, one of the top issues that's on the mind of every CEO is how you develop talent. But more importantly, how do you move talent to where the real opportunities are? And, and when you look back over the last 12 to 18 months, uh, one of the key issues that many CEOs talked about was the imbalance that exists in terms of where their employees are, their talent is today, where it could have been deployed elsewhere in a more productive way, cross-border, and the issues and challenges to deal with that. One of the top areas for investment in the next 12 to 18 months is talent, talent development. Uh, how do you attract, retain, retool uh, talent? Number one, uh, one of the top concerns that everyone's focused on. And I think the organizations that really have that uh, in the spotlight uh, are going to be the ones that really win into the future. And actually, you, you've always stressed, haven't you, that the US has a, I don't know whether the, the right adjective is unique, but it has a tremendous ability to see people migrate from, from one region to another, from one industry to another, and, uh, and that labor, labor mobility and, and labor, yeah. labor adaptability in the US mm -hmm. is Without a, is question, a I, think, I, I think the whole issue of mobility is going to be one of the top challenges that we all face uh, yeah. to really deal with. Uh, making sure that, that all of our talent, wherever it sits today, is deployed in, in the most effective way. Raghu and then Arif wanted to come in on that. Well, I, I think if you look back in history, you see that uh, crises, uh, big crises, uh, tend to be around times of big technological change. Mm -hmm. And the correlation, how it works out, people have models of it, but it's, it's certainly something you see in data. And that speaks to your point that typically uh, the technology sort of creates a whole lot of turmoil, but after that it takes hold. And there is a period of fairly strong growth. So if you look back at history, uh, one would feel confident looking into the future. Somehow we'll work this thing out. And then those technological advances that you're talking about will be taken up. But I think key to that is to preserve the flexibility. And this is why you, know, you have to be bullish on the US 
if in fact it can preserve that flexibility going forward to adjust. Now it, it may be that not all the jobs will be in technology, but there could be a lot of support jobs outside technology for the few who, who actually are in the technology area. Where they will be specifically, it's always hard to predict. This is why it's extremely hard uh, to combat the people who say it's very bleak, because you really can't tell whether jobs right. will be created, but they will be created. Right. Aris I, and then Nouriel. Yeah, yeah, I think innovation and technology critical. Your point was excellent, and it's important to continue that focus. But again, going back to something that I was saying earlier, it's that emotion and negative viewpoints around where the economy is going, more conservatism leads to cutbacks. People and all the surveys that I've been looking at, including yours, talks about CEOs being obsessed with conserving cash. That means less expenditure on R&D, which means less expenditure on innovation. So in a sense, we enter a self-fulfilling cycle which leads against what you're saying, which is very bad. We need to, we need to focus on it. The innovation yeah. is not coming from big companies. Mm -hmm. It's coming from startups where there is enough capital right. funding. But and you're right, which challenge is big companies? Because they have to defunding R&D, which is creating this building right. valley where the innovation is happening. Uh, my concern is that, you know, traditionally you're right that, you know, um, bubbles have been associated with, you know, technological innovation. You had the railroads, the, you know, the car industry, you had the tech bubble that went bust. And after each one of these bubbles went bust, you had at least, you know, a base of productive capacity, like, you know, having all these natural technologies and so on. But in the last 30 years in the United States, we had uh, three bubbles. Two of them have been associated with essentially real estate going bust. Yeah. And the last one was real estate and financial innovation. So my concern is that those innovations that are leading to technological advancement probably leave then a backlog of technology can be spread around the world. In the case of real estate and financial innovation, I didn't see this technological innovation occurring. The biggest change that you, that's really occurred in technology the last 20 years is not the technological changes that you and others have invested in. It's the fact that you're not <laughs> saying that you are investing in and you have uh, operations in China and mm. India and other parts of the world. It used to be the center of technology uh, innovation was in Silicon Valley, but it's changed dramatically. And so many of the great technologi <coughs> technological investments over the next 10, 15 years are going to come not from Silicon else, Valley, yeah. but from India, China, and, other, and Israel and other parts of the world. Hey, so OK, yeah. the sheet for, you understand quite well, sheet for technological progress, uh, you know, prevailing every year, maybe, uh, everywhere, I think, including uh, the, uh, China, Japan, et cetera, et cetera. The, the realistically, much more important problem is how to finance, how to realize they commercialize that technology, in my understanding. Maybe you are discussing the much more core technology. But in the case of China, as I mentioned, now they have a capacity to finance this, the realize financially. Uh, so th th that is another important social aspect of technological progress, I think. Is it too if late you, to get into Facebook at the initial price? <laughs> <laughs> too Don't late to get into Facebook? <laughs> if you go outside the, uh, if you go outside the, uh, the convention center, uh, this, this morning, incidentally, you'll see in a, a prime piece of real estate that I think Reuters and the BBC have had at various times, CCTV, China TV. So um, uh, I was very struck. One quick question with very, very quick answers. Gentleman right at the back has been trying to catch my attention. Tony Poulter from PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, we've pleasure. heard a lot about, yes, not, 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 not aimed at Dennis, I hear some <laughs> Um, we've heard a lot about uh, sentiment, electoral sentiment in particular, and the constraints that might impose on decision-making in the US and the UK at least, whether it's regulatory reform or government asset disposals. I mean, given that, what, how realistic is it to have hopes for a multilateral solution? Um, and if it's not realistic, does it matter, given the discussion we've just had about we innovation? We touched on that a little earlier. Um, uh, does it matter if we, have, if we have multilateral approaches to this? What hopes are there for international cooperation? Kind of quickly around the table. Hey, so do you want to start? Well, uh, we're now discussing these issues uh, in, the, uh, in various places or so. Or, for example, financial regulation will affect a lot to the Asian countries and uh, uh, so we are now sharing the views, sharing the interests on that point. In that process, I think uh, the uh, multilateral advancement will be realized. I think. Okay. David? At the World Economic Forum, you should always say, yes, multilateralism yes. is possible, yes. and, yes. and, and we're going to all come together. But to be realistic, 
Getting national solutions is difficult enough. Getting multilateral solutions to these problems is going to be almost impossible. You should, right? always, you know, say, you should always say international cooperation is essential, but be prepared to be disappointed well, next year. Yeah. 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 Multi-stakeholder solutions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you know what he's saying is, is, is very important and probably correct, but it is critical. I think we're sitting at a watershed moment in global history. 30 years from now, sitting at the World Economic Forum, we're going to turn around and look at occasions like this as seeing moments where the world is changing. Don't forget the last big economic recession led not only to the New Deal, but it also created new monsters and world wars. Okay, So one big shock in the system, and we could all be going back to a seriously big issue. We do need multilateral solutions. We do need it. The trouble is the global economy is becoming globalized more than before. Trade channels, you know, migration, capital movements, technology, information being transmitted around the world. But policies are becoming national. And if you think about the big economic challenges, whether it's energy security, global climate change, reform international monetary system, reserve currencies, global imbalances, financial regulation supervisions, those solutions have to be international. And apart from the question of, say, trade, in which we have an organization like WTO in which there is enforcement power, on all the other questions, there is disagreement. There is no yeah. cooperation. Well, uh, I, th I think there are some issues which need multilateral cooperation. My sense is increasingly those will not be done at summits, but will be done through a global upsurge, through a global democracy, via the internet, via the web, via NGOs. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of that rather than leaders meeting together and deciding things. It'll be an upswell which pushes leaders to actually do the right thing. Dennis, do you think you can answer someone uh, from Pricewaterhouse Group? Yeah, I think you can. I think you can. You know, I, I, for one, just believe that if we don't continue to strive for uh, a global solutions to deal with some of these complex issues, we are going to go backwards. We're not going to go forward. And I think it's absolutely essential that we keep this top of mind in everything that we're trying to focus on. Ladies and gentlemen, please have a look at, uh, at this folder that you all got with, uh, with your uh, materials on Haiti-related activities uh, at the forum this week. And please join me in thanking an absolutely terrific panel. <laughs> have, a, have, a, have a stimulating and enjoyable Davos. Thanks very much. Nice terrific. Well Great. Oh, oh, it's picture, picture, picture.
Ladies and gentlemen, please could you leave the hall? We need to set up for the next session. Please could you leave the hall? We need to set up for the next session. Thank you.